What's up, SCS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. It's not just a tagline, it's our reality, and you're about to find out why with this panel of guests. But, but first, it is week five of the Lori Vallow Daybell trial, day 20 to be precise, uh, and it is the trial, of course, of the so-called Doomsday Mom the wildly twisted story of a seemingly loving mother, a self-proclaimed devout member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who clearly veered way off course and became involved in the deaths of as many as five people, including her own children. Best guest today, two familiar faces. The first, famed Tallahassee defense attorney, R. Timothy Jansen, with the beautiful mahogany wood. Uh, he is a partner in the firm that bears his name, Jansen and Davis. He's handled every sort of complex civil, administrative, and criminal case you can imagine. He also spent five years as a federal prosecutor. No one knows the Tallahassee legal community and the law in general better than Tim. Uh, Nina Hobson, the only woman on the panel today, but we have a woman, so that's good. She is a former British detective who worked covert operations, major crimes, uh, and she did close personal protection. She's investigated murder, rape, kidnap, and global fraud cases. She was also a bodyguard for celebrities and dignitaries around the world. She is an ambassador for children's rights, which is fitting for this story, uh, driving anti-bullying campaigns and fighting for the protection of those vulnerable to harm. And she is the host of a new true crime podcast with a cool name. It's called Codename Siren. The podcast is called Codename Siren. Last but certainly not least, we are all looking up to him figuratively and literally on this angle. Greg Scordis was a Democrat candidate for Utah Attorney General. He's practiced law since 82, even though he looks 32. He also began his uh, work at the Salt Lake Legal Defenders Association. So he too has been on the other side as a prosecutor. Uh, some quick housekeeping notes, Facebook, Insta. You can follow us on Twitter for all our show times at Podcast STS. You can listen to us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Some Brad Bozo gave us one stars, one star on the Markel episode. I think it was a member of the family, but that's just me. I don't know. Uh, also, you can support us on Patreon. And uh, fittingly for that person, it's another buzz off Brad, although I don't even remember <laughs> their name. But anyway, big news today. As you can see, the chief marketing officer, we did it. 50,000 subscribers uh, for Surviving the Survivor. So thank you to the best guests and the best community, STS Nation. Obviously, we are very grateful and indebted to every single one of you. It is just the beginning. So uh, thank you guys for being on this ride with us. It's hard to believe, but back in November, we were not true crime all the time. We were mostly Carmela, Carm, my mom, pontificating. And then uh, we were covering some true crime cases. And then obviously that tragedy happened in Moscow, Idaho. And between November and now, we've picked up 48,000 subscribers and going strong. So thank you to all of you. Uh, the chief marketing officer, I was, look at this, we are uh, in sync today. The chief marketing officer is putting up this, uh, what do you call this, a QR code. And you can scan it, and we're giving away free swag uh, to show our appreciation. You just have to scan that. I think the CMO, the chief marketing officer, will also put up um, the link as well. But uh, I don't know how else to say thank you. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Please tell a friend and uh, please scan the QR code. And uh, we've got hats, we've got shirts, we've got magnets, we've got all kinds of fun things. And we'll send some of that swag out to all of you. So uh, thank you uh, so much. Abby Taha, by the way, Maui Swift already weighing in. Congrats on the 50,000 subs. Thank you so much. Appreciate that uh, very much. So moving on to the... Um, you know what, Tim Jansen, someone said to me, the man with the great hair, Tim Jansen is on. And here he is. And Scordis has good hair. And so does Nina Hobson. And uh, hair is kind of uh, the word of the week in the Lori Vallow trial. 
Uh, there was Lori's hair, we found out yesterday in court, that was uh, found on this piece of duct tape that was on this plastic uh, black bag that wrapped JJ's body. Obviously, uh, not what anyone wanted to hear. We knew about that. Um, but obviously, it appears that there could be a link between Lori and her dead child now. Uh, what do you make of this uh, hair talked about around the world? Well, it's more than a link, okay? Um, DNA, where it's found and when it's found is important. You can leave DNA and it can be there on, on an item for many years, but when you have your DNA or your hair fiber on the masking tape where your dead child was buried, uh, that's pretty bad evidence. That's what we call a bad fact. Put that in a really bad fact pattern. Um, it's hard to explain that. Uh, um, as a lawyer, you really have to come up with a doozy to explain that. Maybe she used that tape previously and whoever committed the crime used the same tape, but you can't sell that. You just cannot sell it. It puts her now involved. She was distanced before. Now she's actually involved in the actual murder. So I think it's devastating to the defense. And uh, Nina, um, you were on the other side of this. These are two criminal defense attorneys, very adept, the ones uh, on the panel tonight. You were an investigator. Um, what about the investigative work that they were able to track this lone hair down that was uh, apparently on this piece of duct tape that was used uh, to uh, bag, literally bag this uh, young boy uh, who was ultimately found murdered? Um, what about the investigative work here? I mean, the investigation would point, well, we've got to now link why that duct tape, it has got the hair on it. But obviously, from an investigation side, um, we have to work with evidence. So is there a reason that that can be explained? Was it that that tape was, you know, taken from her house by somebody else? And that's why the hair's there. So, you know, as an investigator, we just have to look at every single possible avenue and, you um, and, and see whether we come to a dead end or whether we come to a, a junction and that we can further prove the evidence. Because at the end of the day, as an investigator, we want to prove our cases when we get to court. And so we've got to look at everything so that the, the, def the defense can't obviously then, then say otherwise. Um, Greg Scordis, to you, uh, let me just go back in time to court yesterday, and there was a bunch of stuff that happened uh, today as well. But Keely Coleman, she is the uh, senior DNA analyst who testified. Uh, she was a, with a company called Bow Technology and uh, shared that this uh, piece of uh, hair was in fact found. Um, and then it was clarified later on that the tape with Lori's hair was found on the black plastic bag wrapped around JJ's body. Uh, what's interesting here is Keely went on to testify uh, on the stand yesterday, and she said the partial DNA profile matched the DNA profile provided from Lori Vallow Daybell. The probability of randomly selecting a random individual in relation to that profile uh, is one in 71 billion. Um, that kind of figure, how does it play with the jury of Lori's peers in that courtroom? Well, I think Tim really spelled it out very well. And, and we've talked about this a little bit, Joel, that we've spent a lot of time in this trial watching Lori be painted as a person who had uh, the motive to commit this crime and the opportunity to commit this crime. Uh, the whole uh, sex, power, and money theme that the state has had has been very powerful. But what, what the state lacked until this hair was the link, the link between Lori and the actual homicide itself. And I think that this was something that was very powerful for the state. And, you know, we, we, we talk about the importance of these uh, forensics, and, and I think Nina did a good job of explaining that. But, you know, talking about small town in, in South uh, Western Idaho, where this crime took place, the law enforcement there went out of their way, did a very, very thorough investigation. And of course they have these, these things that they're finding and they're digging up. They find the bag, they find the body parts, they find a hair on it. They take it to the DNA lab and it's, and it's, it's money. I mean, it's big, it's big 
uh, evidence for the state in this case and very hard. And I, I know you can make arguments about, well, maybe it was some tape that she had in her house or, or this or that. But boy, that's that's the piece that was missing from the state's case, I think, until until it was produced yesterday, Joel. And uh, Greg, I know defense attorneys like you don't like to say, quote unquote, it's a slam dunk case now or game over. But is it a slam dunk case and is it game over now? I, I think it's a very it was a strong case before. It was a very strong case before, Joel. Now it's now it's um, I don't know if it's game over. I mean, the reasonable doubt is a high standard for the state to prove in any case. And um, Lori's got her alibi. We haven't heard her defense yet, but this jury's got to be leaning toward guilt right now based on the evidence that they've heard. Again, we're not done. The defense still has to present its case, but that's a very, I mean, it's, it's, it's money. It's a, it's a big piece of evidence. And Tim, uh, back to you as a criminal defense attorney. So a lot of people said, what the hell is wrong with this defense team? And uh, quite simple uh, terms. You know, we, we talked about it before, Tim, where at one point Jim Archibald said, I hope no one in East Idaho is watching. I hope they have better things to do. He, he wasn't a, a very fervent uh, supporter of his client. Uh, when this hair uh, was was brought up during testimony, uh, the follow up, uh, people said he just dropped the ball, that the defense dropped the ball again. They basically went to the, you know, the validity of the testing. But you'll see right here, we've got a lot of lawyers, got donuts, who's a friend of the show, checks in all the time. Joe, please give my regards to Carm. Why will the defense, she spells it with a C, like the Brits, because she's Canadian. Why will the defense not simply argue that Lori's hair, which was found on the tape, was not simply a transfer hair from JJ or Alex uh, being with Lori earlier? I mean, they, you know, they slept in the same bed occasionally. Why did they go down that road? That seems like a stronger defense. That's something that jurors would say, oh, OK, but not to say, hey, something was wrong with the testing. I don't think people are going to buy that. What's the strategy there or is there not? You, you, you can't win that unless you have an expert that's going to come in and show that that facility wasn't up to date. Uh, that the, the personnel there have lapses in professionalism or control. That's a losing argument. Um, transfer was really the only way they could possibly argue that. It is her child. There was a blanket, apparently, that might have been his blanket or their blanket that could have transferred onto the tape. Um, but the other thing about it is now, before she could sit there and not really have to put on much of a case, now that you got this DNA on her, on the child, she almost has to put on a case. She almost has to take the stand to try to give an explanation because no one else will be able to. You can't just win by cross-examination. So um, as, re as, recent, as recently as yesterday, uh, court observers, legal experts said the defense might not have any witnesses. But now you think that's gone out the window with his hair. And at the very least, they may have to call Lori. You think they would do that? Well, they have to do something um, because not they had to know before trial that this was coming in. That has to be disclosed. They had a right to depose the expert, to look at all the calculations, the charts. Um, they had to know. So maybe they decided we're going to downplay it. We're not going to make a big deal of it. We'll try to argue in closing that you can't trust it. Uh, it's, but one in 81 billion. I've seen a little higher. Um, I recently had a case where my client claimed that he didn't do anything, but it was like one in like a trillion. I never <laughs> heard of it before. And my client's like, yeah, we better, we might better cut a deal. <laughs> just to so correct you. Just, for the defense, yeah, you know? Not 81 billion, but it's 71 billion, but who's counting? Uh, Greg Scordis, uh, does, Tim Jansen make a good point. Does the defense now have to bring a case? And do you think there is any chance in the world, like we saw in the Alec Murdoch trial, that uh, Lori Vallow gets up on that stand? Well, you know, I, I don't know that the state has much of a choice, but I'll, I'll ask Tim. And, and, and it, we, we were both prosecutors. For, I was at the DA's office in Salt Lake for eight years. I mean, you would you would be you'd die and go to heaven to have Lori Ballow take the stand. So as a prosecutor, you could cross examine her. I mean, mm -hmm. I understand what Tim's saying. You got to put on a defense. Maybe you got to put her on, but man, she's going to be horrible. She's not going to be able to testify uh, very coherently. I mean, the whole trial has been about proving that she's 
got some bizarre thoughts, and I know we're going to get to some of that later, but she's got to stand by those. She's got to live with those, and she doesn't seem to be wavering from that at all. She hasn't seemed to be uh, presented herself as very sympathetic during the trial. She hasn't uh, looked at pictures of her own children in these in this horrible state with with the kind of uh, pain that you would expect a mother to have. And so I don't know how she comes across very well in front of a jury. And uh, I, I think it'd be very risky. My, my guess is that they don't put her on the stand and maybe they, maybe they have their own forensic expert who's going to talk about the DNA and, and talk about the way that, that it was done incorrectly. But I mean, let's say it's one in a hundred million. I mean, it's still, the numbers are still just astronomical, especially in the state of Idaho that probably has a million people on a good day. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I don't know how, I don't know what the defense is going to be. And, and they haven't given us a heads up either. I mean, we talked about openings where I would attended those. They didn't, they didn't tell us anything about what they intend to put on, except they're going to say at the end of the trial, there's reasonable doubt. Um, Nina, I've got some macro questions for you that I was going to uh, put to you, but we just got this question from Stephanie Ella, by the way, Nina, it's your first time, but ST and I know you have your own podcast, but there's no better community than STS Nation. They're very involved. Uh, and Stephanie writes, does the Chandler, Arizona Police Department have blood on their hands with regards to this case? So Charles Vallow uh, was shot and killed there, and there will be a, a trial surrounding that. Um, but they were Charles Vallow called the Chandler police and basically it's a bad euphemism here, uh, a bad phrase, I should say. But, uh, you know, he fired warning shots and said, look, uh, they're trying to kill me. And um, I don't want to say a blind eye was turned, but nothing was really done. However, you want to define it. Um, is there any kind of liability here, do you think, in your opinion, with this police department for not acting more or doing more potentially? Yeah, you know, we see it often in, in lots of cases, and there were a number of red flags in this case, that probably being the first one. There he goes, her behavior's changed. He goes and says, they're trying to kill me. She's this. She, I don't feel safe. And what was actually done? Now, it's, hindsight's a wonderful thing in policing, and we can go back and say, well, we should have done this. Um, I mean, I have a number of red flags that I'm sure we'll discuss that it's like, yes, somebody has to be accountable. And we've seen it in other cases, you know, Gabby Petito, and we talking about a slam dunk, is this a straight over case? No, absolutely not, because we've seen also seen a number of cases that, right to the last minute we think that person's guilty and then they're found not guilty and obviously there's a very famous case of uh, the california footballer that that happened and i have actually been on cases myself that i've investigated and i was on the child protection unit for seven years and the seconded to the pedophile squad and you know i've been lived through a case from investigation to to court and it, at court, it's been a case of who was the best on the day with regards to attorneys. And I have been so, this has definitely happened to a point I've got to court where it's like, mm, maybe maybe I was wrong, but I investigated the case. So um, theatrics, and I apologize, gentlemen, um, but it's it's who's good on, on the day in that court to be able to get that jury to turn around. So this is definitely not, over in any way shape or form uh interesting take and uh the first person to admit about theatrics is tim jansen who taught that to me basically says uh the courtroom is a place for a performance and uh tim jansen goes into character every once in a while on this show and he's uh he's phenomenal he always gets me every time he does it um I want to get back to you in a little bit, Nina, about just crime in general and the difference between UK crime and uh, American crime and the fascination and all that. But we'll get to that momentarily. Uh, Tim Jansen, uh, Stephanie writes, does anybody else think Chad's going to divorce Lori soon after she's convicted and before his own trial in order to try to distance himself from her? As a defense attorney, if you're uh, John Pryor, who is Chad Daybell's attorney, and by the way, Tim, he wore a polo shirt to court today, not just a T-shirt. Oh, not the T-shirt. Yeah, so I'm sure you'll be happy to Low hear key. that. Would Would you, you know, ever? I, I, don't, 
<laughs> I mean, would you ever I, advise your client to say, hey, let's say she's convicted. Would you say, hey, maybe it's time to get a divorce, too? There's a lot of ways to prepare your witnesses for trial. A lot of times people put them in wheelchairs, they give them haircuts, they buy them glasses. A trial is nothing but a performance. Judges don't like to hear that. Prosecutors don't like to hear that. It, that all it is is a performance. And the witnesses are the actors coming in. And each script, each table has their own script. And the, the opening, it appears to me that either defense has no theory and they're on the fly and they're going to go fluid with it and they're just going to stick with, okay, reasonable doubt. We're going to take whatever route we can, whatever rabbit hole we can go, see what's best fits, and we'll argue that in closing. Otherwise, you normally, the most effective lawyers, tell a jury quickly, early, what the defense is going to be, what the evidence is going to be. So you walk them through it. So then when the jury hears exactly what you say to them, comes out, you built credibility up. Then you go in and you close and say, I told you, we told you, ladies and gentlemen, that's why we wanted this trial. We told you this is the evidence, and that's why our client's not guilty. But to try to establish credibility when you don't give them anything, that's really difficult, especially with the DNA finger or hair sample or hair fiber on the dead body. That's that's a really bad fact. <laughs> <laughs> I like that term, a bad fact. Um, Tali is watching us in Israel. Hello, STS fam. Always the best guest, as you're seeing right now. By the way, Dr. Von Decay, I saw this the other day. I'm going to get the chief technical officer on this. Are closed captions available? I'm almost sure that they are. Um, I have the technical ability of my mother, which is not very good. I was going to save my three-year-old, but my three-year-old knows way more than me. But we'll get on it and see uh, uh, if we can get it going here. Um, Joyce Kirby, Greg, says, I'm curious. I've always heard that a spouse cannot be used to testify against the other spouse. Is this true, Greg Scordis? It's, it's, uh, it's often true, and that's why I would have said no to the earlier question about Chad divorcing Lori, because under some circumstances, he may be able to keep her from testifying, uh, invoking what they call the marital privilege, and she could probably invoke that as well. It's very limited, and in this case, maybe not even applicable because of the nature of the crime. Um, but uh, with respect to conversations, communications between the two of them, if Chad wanted to, to, to keep those out, he would be well to, to keep the marriage going, although the conversations were made during the marriage, so they may be protected anyway. But um, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't see how he gains anything by, by divorcing her or, or uh, doing anything in that light. Um, and and like, the, like the question is, you know, the, there, there are certainly privileges. Um, uh, Tim and I enjoy those with our clients, a privilege that to, to, we can talk to them and, and they can't, you know, things that we learn and they tell us can't be used in a court. And to some extent, that's, there's a marital privilege that has the same uh, power. It just in this case, it's probably not going to be very applicable because the, the crime involves the children. Uh, Nina, to you, I know you're obviously a big advocate of children's rights. Uh, it's a big part of uh, who you are and what you believe in. Uh, so just from a kind of a wide perspective, when you heard about this case and the children being murdered in this hideous way, what went through your mind? You know, as a mom first, before anything else, um, so I think that we look at it from society that when a mom commits this crime, it feels so much worse when a, than when a father does it because we're considered the nurturers. And, you know, to actually work on murders, child murders, it's horrendous. It's a horrendous thing to have to do. But when it's a mom, it just hits harder. And... Um, and, and the way that these children were killed, you know, there's no, there's no easy way. And there, there's nothing that makes a child murder good in any way or even plausible. But when it's so horrific and it's a mom, and, and even now when we're talking about the case, and for me, the media, it's, it's very much focused on mom. And I know that they were her, her children or ad one was adopted, but it's, it's the mom because that's the bit that we can't get to terms with. 
Uh, the Utah medical examiner was on the stand yesterday. That is Greg's home state and uh, where this all happened with uh, Tammy Daybell. And then today, uh, neighbors of Chad and Tammy's took the stand and offered some interesting testimony, which we'll get into. Uh, but this question, uh, Tim Jansen from Barbie Rice, how can they prosecute Lori for conspiracy to commit murder with Tammy Daybell when her death certificate says natural causes well you can always have a change in circumstances and a lot of times if they cannot pinpoint a cause of death because they didn't have enough information or they weren't looking for it they normally put natural causes but now that they've reinvestigated it and they see lacerations on her hands and her chest which appears to show that she was bound and gagged that could lead that same person that did the autopsy to change their opinion and open it up to the fact that maybe it wasn't natural causes. And I, nothing prohibits it. A jury will have to make a decision what they believe is credible. And I think based on the evidence, they can show that with her conditions, she was healthy, she didn't have a heart condition, and there was no medication that would have caused her to have a stroke or anything, that it wasn't more likely natural causes and you add in these outside influences these two people and their motives um i think there's a strong likelihood that that charge could be moved forward a baby doll fan of the show and a big fan of tim jansen sts nation with the heart emojis for tim she always uh compliments the hair so uh there you go uh and then look at this michelle burns joel and carm congrats on fifty thousand. it should be five hundred thousand. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. We're just getting cracking. Uh, now we've got Nina, Tim, and, and uh, Greg helping us, so we're going to get there. Um, Mr. Scordis, to you, um, does Chad now turn around and just brutally throw Lori Vallow under the proverbial bus? Someone asked if you, if you will also back back over her now. Um, what do you think? He probably doesn't have much choice uh, when he goes to trial, especially if she's convicted. And uh, I think he was, uh, he and his attorneys were tickled that they could separate the two trials because <clears throat> it's easier uh, when you're not uh, sitting next to each other to, to point fingers at each other. And I, the state certainly wanted to try these cases together. And they made some some errors in the disclosure of uh, the DNA, for example, and other discovery that gave uh, Chad the opportunity to separate his trial from Lori's. Now, Lori wanted to get her trial going. She wasn't going to waive any further speedy trial rights, and the judge was tied between what to do. So they've separated the two. I'm surprised that, that Lori hasn't and her counsel haven't blamed Chad a little bit more. They sort of alluded to that a little bit, that, that and, and they've sort of uh, hinted on the fact that she was uh, maybe uh, swayed by him or persuaded by him. Uh, but if she's convicted, uh, I don't think there'll be much hesitation for Chad and his team to, to blame her for a lot of this and, and give the jury some, some solace, I guess, that someone's been held accountable for this and that someone has been convicted. And so there's certainly a problem if, if, if Lori walks and, and is found not guilty, then Chad is going to be Swear, squarely in, in that jury's crosshairs because somebody killed these kids. And um, I, I just think that, uh, that that he's going to have a hard time pointing too much at her, however, it, it, although I just think he may not have any choice. Uh, for those uh, who don't know, we started our true crime journey uh, with the Dan Markell case. Uh, he was an FSU, which is where Tim Jansen is based, a law professor who was gunned down in his driveway uh, in 2014. And uh, it happened in 2014. And a trial is set to start in the fall of the former brother-in-law, Charlie Adelson, uh, who's now accused of hiring two hitmen along potentially with the uh, mother and the ex-wife, Wendy, who are co-conspirators in this case. There was a question, uh, I scrolled past him, but People were asking if you see any sort of similarity or comparisons between Wendy and Lori here. Wendy's much more sophisticated and intelligent. She's got a law degree, a professor. Um, she's pretty calm. You've seen her testify. She um, she's very she's very smooth on the stand. You can't say that about Lori. 
I mean, her, she would be the com complete opposite. Um, these crazy things she does, clothing that she wears. Now, Wendy did wear the same dress like two years in a row. <laughs> she testified twice and she wore the exact same dress a year later to testify in, which we haven't been able to figure that out yet. She, certainly she has more than one dress. You know, well, you told so, me you said it's because actors wear the I same uh, costumes. <laughs> so that's what I'm getting going in her role. She put her costume back on and did the same thing. That's what I'm going with. Misdemeanor here says, because this happened Sunday night, I hope Carm does a walkthrough across the set and removes the life size cutout of herself again. I've now super glued it to the floor. So uh, she can no longer do that. Carly says, I love Tim. You make my day. Teresa. I like the way she phrases this. Leave your DNA on the like button. Come on, everyone. Uh, and <laughs> Lisa, look back at how people found Surviving Survivor. I found you when you were covering the Moscow murders. Now I can't get enough. As I like to say, it's better and safer than crack cocaine. So <laughs> stick with STS. Um, Nina, I always ask new guests this. Why this fascination with true crime, especially the British perspective? Are, are Brits as enamored? I don't know if that's a good word to use, but are Brits as attached, addicted uh, to true crime as people in the United States are, do you think? No. no. <laughs> it's not part. And, and wh why do you think that is? I mean, you're obviously um, a much less violent society, I would say. Um, how many do you know how many homicides there are in in the UK a year, roughly? I don't know. No, I, I don't. And I know that we have a huge issue with knife crime as opposed to gun crime, because we only have one percent of each police force even carrying a gun. And so the we we had a mass shooting where I think it was it may have been 89, maybe 93, and that's when our gun crime laws changed our, our gun laws changed we do have an issue with with stabbings uh and we're like you know we're just a, a lot smaller country and, and but i can hand on heart say that the british police and they have their issues going on right now um but they are the best in the world and we we are the only weapon we have is the voice most of the time um and i mean we don't even carry a taser so it's wow. the the obsession with crime is definitely something that I have seen more of here. However, I've lived it. it it's been my day to day for 30 years. So, but am I glad that people over here are obsessed with crime? Yeah, I got a podcast and I can tell you all about it. But what, what is what is your podcast about? I know the it's code named Siren. So uh, what, what do you discuss? It's very, it's real. So I talk about my investigations as I'm doing them. Um, you know, my friend and I had a, both of us had a hit on our lives for very different reasons. Mine got removed, his didn't. So we, we talk about comparisons like that, um, witnesses um, and victims. So anything to do with crime, we, we will discuss and, and talk through. It's, it's very real because we're living it at the time also so well, well i hope the friend who has a hit out still has more than a taser i can tell you that um <laughs> that yeah i use the the word friend loosely yeah <laughs> <laughs> tolly from israel uh greg to you as a lawyer how can you prevent jurors from not being biased how can they be objective such a horrific case i can't even fathom this I would have even convicted her on the raccoon at the pet cemetery when she was texting with Chad about this so-called raccoon. That was really a euphemism. Uh, everyone thinks for the burial of JJ and Ty Lee. Well, Tim and I both tried high profile cases, uh, both as prosecutor and defense attorney. And you know that jurors have information about the case. They have some preconceived notions about the case, but I'll tell you something, Joel, I, I, I trust the jury system. I really do. And I think we vet them out well. The judge asked them questions before the trial. Can you put aside your bias? Can you put aside what you think you know about this case? Can you judge the evidence based solely on, the, on what you hear during this trial and not what you think you know? And those jurors took an oath. They raised their right hand and, and swore that they would do that. Now, I know it's easier said than done, but, but I, I do think jurors try to follow the law. They try to to hold the state to its burden. And they try to say, look, uh, we started this trial with the presumption of innocence. We're going to honor that. 
We're going to keep that presumption in, in the back of our minds until the state pre, pre, uh, prevails uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. We're going to wait until all the evidence is, is presented by both sides. And, and I know this case got a lot of, of high profile, and that's why it was moved from, from uh, down in the southern part of the state up to, up to Boise, which is the biggest county, Ada County, the largest population base in the state of Idaho. And, and sort of to get them away from the, the hometown nature of this and the, and the local flavor of it. And, and I think this jury, I mean, just watching them want to do the right thing. They seem to be attentive. They seem to be paying attention. They don't seem to be, you know, rolling their eyes or shaking their heads or that kind of a thing. And certainly there's emotion when you see children. That's emotion with anyone. But I, I don't know. I, I, maybe I sound Pollyanna-ish, but I, I trust the jury system. And I, I think that the, the, they did a, I mean, they spent four days just selecting a jury. They, they certainly went out of their way to try to do the best they could to select a fair uh, dozen jurors to hear this case through, through its end. Tim, anything you want to add? Do you always trust your jurors? No, I do not. <laughs> um, it depends on the case. If it's a high profile case, you have people that want to get on the jury for different reasons. Uh, and I found that out and I caught a juror trying to lie. I was prosecuting a doctor in Panama City and I finally got a question. Well, he's your doctor. Yes. And if he's convicted, you'll have to get a new doctor. So you're and she said, yes. So the judge kicked her off. She took her shirt off and lifted her shirt and it said free Freddie Williams. She was outside picketing like two days before the trial. Um, mm -hmm. There is a difference between state and federal court. Federal court, you don't get many questions. The judges do not allow you to really ask the questions you need. But on the other hand, the jurors know it's serious in federal court. They're not going to screw around because they think they may become part of an investigation. In the state system, it's, uh, it's quite the opposite. you got a lot more involvement picking a jury. But then you got people on the jury that don't take it serious because you got like six jurors instead of 12. Uh, it's kind of loosey-goosey in state court. If they know somebody, they might tend to lean one way. Um, jurors have biases. The only rule is that your, uh, your verdict has to be based only on the evidence. They all have biases. They all come in with how they feel about things. And that's what the lawyers are asking them. They want to know how they feel about things. And then each side's trying to get one favorable for them. Um, Nina, to you from Marcia Sanford, this is kind of interesting from Nova Scotia. I scratch my head regarding Tammy that an autopsy wasn't legally mandated, especially seeing bruises and law enforcement being uh, suspicious from the get go. And we will get into that testimony. Um, coroner's call question mark and your thoughts. I asked the same question when I saw that. I was like, how have we got to this point where that, you know, they declined the autopsy? And, and it's like, I'm not sure how that's even possible. Um, so that that was my thought. And uh, shout out to uh, Carrie May, a new member, and Carrie Stewart asking, how do you submit your information here to get merchandise? We had a... Um, QR code up and uh, hopefully the chief marketing officer will get the link back up and I'll put the link into the summary uh, to, tonight of tonight's show. So you can find the link there as well. Candy Temple saying hi here from uh, San Diego. So um, back to this, um, uh, Greg, to Dr. Eric Christensen, uh, Utah chief medical examiner. Do you know him? You, you do a lot of work there, uh, Greg, it's your home state. You know this yeah, generation. I mean, I have a good rapport and good relationship with the medical examiner's office here in Utah, and I've worked with them. They're they're certainly very skilled. I mean, we, we they're they're necessary. I mean, as a prosecutor, you can't do a homicide case without a cause of death, and uh, you can't uh, talk to the jury about what happened without uh, going through that. So they're they're necessary. They do a good job. I mean, they try to be uh, op, uh, objective and fair, and um, you know, but but it. it it, they don't necessarily have to do an autopsy every time there's an unattended death. I mean, we, we expect that. And uh, for a normally healthy person, you would, you would hope that that occurred. And given the circumstances, like Nina said, you, this, this one probably should have had the, the medical involved right from the, right from the start, but it, it's not like every time somebody dies, you know, they're up at the 
ME's office uh, having an autopsy performed. It's just, it's just not practical, especially when uh, some people die in a hospital or for other causes and they, they, the cause of death is fairly obvious and we don't need to go through that. In this case, yeah, that was, a, that was probably a mistake by the state not to have uh, dotted that I and crossed that T and done that from the beginning, given the, the nature of everything else that was going on at the time. And uh, Tim, Mr. Meaner asked a question, which I believe I know the answer to. Did the defense know about the matched hair before it was presented in the trial? And I believe the answer is yes. My question to you, why didn't they seem better prepared for it once uh, that testimony was dropped? Well, <laughs> this is one answer I'll give you. We don't build the planes. We fly them. You can't change the facts. And in the middle of trial, bad things happen. And you have to prepare and make it look like it's not a bad thing. I do that a lot of times when the state's key witness is testifying. I'll get a piece of paper and look like I'm not even watching the witness. I know exactly what the witness is going to say. But the jurors, jurors are looking at you. And if you're looking like it's important, then they're going to think it's important. But if you're like thinking it's not that important, maybe they won't think it's important. It's again, it's a it's a production. It's a show. Um, they knew it. They had to know it. There would be a mistrial, prosecutorial misconduct. Judge wouldn't have allowed it in. Um, so they knew and they made a conscious trial decision to do what they did. And it's not going to be it's not going to be overturned. It's a trial decision how you cross examination. So it, it, they must have a strategy. And I guess we'll find out at the end. And uh, Greg, uh, the harping on the hair continues. Samantha M. says, I have long blonde hair. I find it on my son's clothing all the time, all over the place, actually. So I don't know. I think they uh, priced her guilt I'm probably uh, already, but I don't think the hair matters so much. Um, but you think it does. I want well, that. I it... <laughs> By the way, your guy's hair matters because MC Spunky says, I think they have great hair as well. But alas, Tim and Greg's is better. Uh, but what about that? Just just to put a little bow on it, even though I'm sure we'll come back to it again. I, I think the hair was important. But, but you know, we, we've said this from the beginning of this trial, Joel. And I think Tim will agree with me. A, a, a trial is is a, a production. He talks about it. And, and it's a and the hair was one more piece. It's one more piece in this this puzzle that they put together for the jury. It's one more one more stage of the of the of the performance they're putting on. So no, I mean, I don't think that it's that you win this trial based solely on the hair, but it it's it's another brick in the wall. I mean, it's it they've got so much more and they build up so much about her character and her lying about the nature of the children, her lying about where they are, her her just cold. Uh, response to these phone calls that we talked about the other day from people who are saying, Lori, you're a murderer. And she's just like, well, you know, it, the truth will come out later on. So, I mean, no, the hair isn't the, the end all, but it's, it's certainly important. And in terms of the state's case, you know, building this case and putting the states together, I think it's a very important piece of evidence. When I heard about it, I'll tell you what, Joel, I thought that was the, that was what I was waiting for. That's what I've been waiting for in this case was was that a little bit more tie in between Lori and the homicides, because she's trying to say I was off in, in Hawaii. Well, your hair ain't going to get on those 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 items when you're off in Hawaii. I mean, that that's puts her puts her much closer than she's wanted to be so far. Yeah. And uh, John Shepard writes, I find it ironic that Lori's hair that has served her so much in her life in beauty pageants is now becoming her downfall, followed by this. Uh, that is called <laughs> irony, followed by Arwen Hardy. Uh, Joseph Scott Morgan uh, has appeared on our show many times. Uh, he's one of the uh, preeminent forensic experts uh, in the world. And uh, he explained, I guess, on another show that her hair being on the modality of J.J.'s murder is different than finding her hair on his clothes. So uh, you've got that. Mm -hmm. um, Nina Hobson, again, just a, you bring so much to the table. So I'm curious on, on a kind of bigger picture scale. I mean, you've, I'm sure, investigated homicides of children. What is it like to come up on a scene that they have described in Rexburg, Idaho? These two bodies of these two young people are buried. And how do you know how to begin, and is there added pressure because they're young children? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think you add the pressure to yourself, but for, you know, we never talk really, we talk about bad policing and that always hits the media, but good policing and the fact that you go to these scenes, we are human after all, you know, we don't have um, a, a cloak that we put around us that we go to these scenes, but we are very professional too. So you have to use your professionalism to make you get through it. And not everybody can, and not every police officer can, but the long-term effects on going to a scene like that, again, don't get spoken about. And I, unfortunately, um, I went to a number of child murders, and fortunately, I have actually, you know, I'm one of the few people that I can, I can separate the two and I can go home. I want to go home and give my kids a hug, um, probably not now because they're old and that would be weird, but um, I wanted to go home and give them a hug as soon as I came back to make sure that, you know, my life was still real and my kids were safe. But, you know, you can go through any amount of training. And again, the British police, we have a lot of training in lots of aspects but no one can train you to actually deal with a scene like that and not being affected in some way, but then have your professionalism kick in. And that's what we do. Uh, and, you know, people who have dealt with this, you know, the, the police officer's clearly been emotional about it and what he's seen. And, and I feel, I feel for him. Mm -hmm. Uh, my own mother, who is a Holocaust survivor, has said she always had to use humor in life, and she's a, one of the funnier people that I know, so don't come at me with hate email when this question goes up. From Jennifer, a Jersey girl, who says, hey, Tim, are you in Seminole uh, country? Are you a fan? <laughs> Tim Jansen. I am in Seminole country. In full disclosure, I went to school at the University of Florida, Ooh. undergrad in law school. My wife Ooh. is a Seminole. Um, I did represent Florida State players for five years, and I helped them win a national title. So I do get some leeway. I guess what they say is I'm the only Gator that they like. Uh, and I want to, on, on Nina, um, a murder of a child is like the most difficult case you could defend. It, it's the, the only thing next would be is this molestation of a child. And if you molest a child, and if it's a parent, not a step parent, but a parent, those are terrible cases. They're hard cases to do. And I know, Greg, sometimes we take cases that we don't realize how horrific it is. But our job is not to judge. Our job is to make sure the process works, make sure they get a fair trial. And so you have to do it. And sometimes it's not popular. You take non-popular cases, and, and it could wear on you and wear on your family. But, you know, you do the best you can and make sure the guy gets a, or the girl gets a fair trial. But when children are involved, it's really hard. I have a hard time. I, I don't turn cases away, but I indirectly do because it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's and I have two children and it's hard to go home at night uh, knowing and seeing those pictures and knowing that you're putting your skills to help a person that did that get away with it. That's hard. It's not easy. Uh, there's ethics involved and, you know, we do the best we can. Well said, Tim. Angela writes, I have long hair, but not on my scotch or duct tape. And I uh, thought you meant scotch the drink. I just realized scotch tape. <laughs> scotch tape and duct tape. Uh, but that tells you where my mind is. Uh, the Agile Equestrian, congrats on 50,000 subs. Lori is done, hair or not. So that is, uh, seems to be the consensus that she's, her goose is cooked. Um, Nina, back to you. Uh, investigators, law enforcement are some of the best human observer observers that I've ever met. And uh, Samantha writes, yeah, her behavior, meaning Lori is so odd, laughing with her attorneys, that phone call with her sister was moving um, on that call. The sister was yelling at her, but there have been reports. Obviously, it's not being uh, filmed, but we're hearing audio. But she has been kind of cackling, laughing, joking with her um, attorneys during the most dire moments of her entire life. What do you make of that behavior? You know, we haven't been able to see her and there's a lot to be said, but what we have seen of her is that she's coming across as a cold person. And, and again, back to the nurturing feel of being a mom, she's not giving any of that to anybody. And does this laughy, jokey, being with her attorney, does that play into the kind of role that, you know, she's, 
she's crazy, that she's got mental health issues, that she sees zombies, that this is all part of a cult. Um, one thing I do want to say is that no one anywhere behaves the way that they're expected to behave. You know, we watch a movie and somebody's raped and that's how a rape victim should behave. They should be distraught. Um, they should be this. They should be that. You, you can never say how a human's going to react, whatever it is. And, and just a, a little story, um, I actually was always wanted to be a dog handler. Uh, I didn't want to be a detective. I thought detectives were dickheads, excuse my language. But, um, I, <laughs> very English. Um, but I actually, because I was a young police officer and female, my role back then in 89, 90 was to look after um, women and children. And so I didn't know what the hell I was doing with a, with a child. I didn't like kids. I was 18 years of age. Um, but I also got to be a rape officer because I was female. And I went um, and my job was to look after a rape victim and sit with her while she went through her medical examination and then be shouted at by the chief superintendent because I hadn't got a name of the who, who'd done the crime. And a lady came in with me, and it was the most horrific rape probably that I ever worked on. And she was coming into an uh, underground car park, and she was approached from behind, and she had her eyes super glued together by the offender so that she couldn't identify him. It was horrific. She was the calmest, most amazing person that I probably ever met, other than my mom and my daughter. And and sometimes my son, but um, she was so calm. She, she was kind of com comforting me because it was so horrendous and she didn't want to tell anyone in her family. We eventually did catch the offender, um, but, and that's why I became a detective because I was like, I now want to put people away who did this. But if you had had a video on that room at that time, every single person would have said, this is, this is a lie. This hasn't happened to her. So it's really hard to say how people are going to behave. And I've also been on cases where there's been a lot of manipulation, the, the dynamics between a intimate couple and a child murder have been very interesting to see, as opposed to it, it being somebody going at it alone. Uh, wow super glued eyes and the way nina speaks now i'm uh, i want to listen to this podcast called codename siren that is her podcast codename siren um greg to you dreaming cat studio joel do your guests think the defense will be bring in an expert on hair shedding we cannot get away from the hair here um uh, there's an expert for everything is there an expert for hair shedding and will they bring them in it's not, not the kind of thing, Joel, that you need an expert for. I mean, we all comb our hair and we all see what's in the comb. Uh, we all sleep in a pillow and see what's left on the pillow. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that requires expert testimony uh, any more than, than certain other uh, the things that we, we see and perceive in our normal lives. So I, I just don't see that in this case. Um, I, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's something that the jurors can bring to the table themselves through their own common sense. And, and I think Nina mentioned something earlier about her hair. Uh, it can be found in various places of this and that. And, and, and I think that's what the defense is going to argue, that, you know, if you're home well, long enough, your hair is going to be found on the couch or on, on this or that. Maybe you're in your shop, you know, on, 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 the, on a tool or on a piece of tape or something. I mean, it, it's... It's, it's not something that, that really is, is really there for expert testimony. It's just there for common sense. And, and the jurors will bring that to the table themselves. Again, we're, 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 people are trying to sort of find a way around this hair thing. It's just such a powerful piece of evidence that, you know, an expert's probably not going to get you very far, even if you did have such an expert. And Greg, Arwen Hardy, her own defense attorneys don't want to defend her. Have you been down this road? And I mean, what can you really do? Well, I mean, we, we do like to defend our clients. That's what we do. I mean, that it's the Constitution of the United States. It's, it, we don't have to like them or hang out with them when the trial's over. But but that's what we do. What, one thing that bothered me, and I think we talked about this um, on the, like the first or second night after trial, was that the defense attorneys sort of came out 
and not in their opening statements and said things like, you know, I'm a public defender. Uh, I don't get to pick and choose my own cases. They get assigned to me, which is sort of a, a sign that, well, you know, I didn't really, I didn't really, Lori, Lori and I didn't, this isn't a, a match made in heaven. And then they walked out of the trial at one point during the recess of that morning, that first morning of, ex, of, of testimony and said, uh, we tried to resolve this case. We, we went to the state, we were, we were trying to get a resolution almost making excuses. So, I mean, you don't, you don't have to, to be in love with your client or, 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 you know, just feel like this great compassion for them. But we all have, I, I, and I can tell just from my hour here with Tim, we all have compassion for the law and respect for the whole, for the whole system. And, and you want it to work. You want it to work. You want the jury to do their job. And um, notwithstanding other parts about the client and, and, and Lori's got a, Tremendous amount of baggage, a tremendous amount of baggage. Defense is going to have to eat, eat that and still come in strong at closing and say the state still hasn't carried the day. And they may not like their client at the end, but that, that's that's got to be their that's got to be their 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 focal point when they could do their closing state, their closing arguments. So look for that. And that could be coming much sooner than expected. Uh, court watchers think this trial could be over. Um, some said by the end of this week, although it's already almost Wednesday. Time moves quickly. Uh, Kato Harris, so, Tim Jansen. So yes, sir. So, you know, the courts go to great lengths to make sure that the juries don't know if a defendant has a public defender. They, they cover that up because they don't want them to know they have a public defender. And for the public defender to come out and say that and make excuses is, is, is a violation of the Sixth Amendment, violation wow. of that person's right to a fair trial. It should not happen. They should never express their own personal feelings when they're getting ready to defend somebody in a high-profile case. That's just very well said. I, wow, I did not know that actually. So uh, very interesting. You learn something new every day. Uh, Tim, to you, Kate O'Hara. Do you think when Lori is found guilty for a conspiracy to commit murder, the sentence will be harsher because the death penalty was taken off the table, or is there some sort of uh, maximum? Uh, mandatory maximum sentence. Uh, I know you're in Florida and this is Idaho, but any idea here? Uh, I don't know what the Idaho law is. Maybe Greg knows it. Um, in Florida, if she would be convicted of first degree murder, she gets a mandatory life sentence if death isn't on the table here. Um, so I don't know what Idaho law is. Um. Nina, to you, so a big part of the testimony today was this medical examiner from the state of Utah talking about bruises um, that were discovered. He, uh, this person was on the stand yesterday and then again today um, on Tammy Daybell. And basically, Chad Daybell said, claimed she had some kind of medical conditions. Uh, so today, um, on the cross by the defense, uh, they were basically trying to intimate that maybe it was a medication maybe she had some issues here uh the neurologist uh, said looked at tammy uh, closely but on the cross uh jim thomas asked is it possible he could have missed something this neurologist um and is it possible she could have died from a seizure isn't it true that a side effects of fluoxetine which is a generic form of um prozac causes seizures so they were looking for all this uh, but this goes back to this point about the autopsy. Um, would it have been sus suspicious to you that a seemingly healthy woman, middle-aged, not old, um, just up and dies with no previous medical conditions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that would be the the warning marker. But um, and I think we addressed it earlier that not everyone has an autopsy. You know, I, th I think well, it used to be in the UK that if you had been seeing a doctor for a certain amount of time, you didn't have to have an autopsy. Um, but yeah, this was somebody who at the time was considered well. Um, sadly, now the whole family, are, uh, you know, his kids are, are saying that, you know, she wasn't well. Um and that they they believe it's innocent, that dad's innocent. But at, at that time, it, that would definitely raise a flag. But then we also look at the other flags that have been raised along the way. And um, somebody really needs to have a look at, at what's happened here. Not that it's going to change anything. It's not going to bring any anyone back. But the fact that things have got... I can't get my head around the fact that those children 
were missing for so long in this society where everyone knows everything about everybody all of the time. How can those kids have been missing for so long? And, you know, nobody did anything. That's a, that's a, a huge issue um, and a huge issue that I have with the police and the way that things were done. And I'm very pro good policing, but I'm also very vocal about bad policing. That, that both of those are important. I think law enforcement does a great job. People also questioning. We did a show on this this past Sunday night about Lori and Chad's inner circle um, and why, you know, they're not legally liable. But a lot of these friends knew there was a lot of craziness uh, circulating and no one seemed to uh, speak up too much. By the way, KCL is a, a friend of the show from Salt Lake City. Population of the world is 7.9 billion. Population of the U.S. is 334 million. They said it was a one in 71 billion chance a hair on the tape on the bag on JJ was anyone but Lori's. That sounds like something a uh, an attorney would bring out in court. Uh, speaking of that, uh, Greg, um, so back to this, uh, the the injuries on Tammy Daybell, um, the prosecutor said, uh, Lindsay Blake, while you can't say for sure, did those bruises appear consistent with someone who was restrained? And the medical examiner said they are consistent with that. And then this whole issue of the seizure came up, I believe, because she ended up on the floor somehow. So the prosecutor says, would you expect a dead person to roll out of bed? And it's a courtroom, so they have to be serious. And the, the chief medical examiner responds by saying, not without some sort of force um obviously lindsey blake underscoring the fact that if she was already dead and maybe asphyxiated uh which is what they believe happened um then you wouldn't expect her to just fall out of bed but what's going on here in the courtroom with tammy daybell and the seizures on the one hand and on the other hand she was perfectly healthy and nothing nothing to see here but the defense saying there is maybe something to see here maybe she was sick it's just defense and state posturing here to try to convince a jury uh, to, to their side? Well, it's the state trying to argue, uh, Joel, that, the, okay, we don't have the, 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 the autopsy in the way that you might all want, but let's look at the facts of the case. Let's look at all the circumstances uh, and look at the marks on her, uh, where she was found, all the other things that are going on, and ask the jurors, Really, what do you really think happened here? Do you really, I mean, I think that's what their argument is going to be at the end of the day. Do you really think she died of natural causes? Is there anybody, this, this, any of the 12 of you that are going to buy that story right now? Because, because, uh, given, given the, the, the totality of the evidence that the states put on here and, and, and everything that's going on with Lori and Chad, I think it's, it's logical for the jurors to conclude, of course, she was killed. You know, she she was in she was in the wrong place at the wrong time with these two yahoos who are doing all kinds of mischief. And yeah, there's enough evidence for the jurors to decide, OK, we don't have the we don't have a medical examiner saying this woman was murdered. But there's sure a lot of circumstantial evidence that points to that and, and not just circumstantial, but some real evidence, you know, marks and bruises and things like that. The jury could say, you know what, we believe beyond a reasonable doubt that she was murdered. And we believe that, that Lori committed it. And I think that's what the state's trying to, trying to get them over that hurdle. Uh, Maggie Seymour uh, weighing in here. Uh, everyone's fascinated, of course, by the jurors and Lori Vallow, but also by John Pryor, uh, the slovenly uh, defense attorney who only wears a T-shirt at times to court, who's defending Chad Daybell. Um, please ask the best guest, Tim Jansen, what John Pryor is coming up and whispering to in the defense attorney's ears every day. It, it is reported that every morning he's coming up and he's whispering. Any idea what that could be about? Well, he may be going back to his client. And if the client is somehow watching the trial, giving information for them to use in cross-examination to help them because it may help him later down the road or they want these questions asked so they can prepare for their trial. Otherwise, it, it, it's, it's really not appropriate um, to be doing that in the middle of a trial, going up to a lawyer sitting in a chair, unless you're part of that team and you're working on that case to be asking questions. Although they are part and parcel, they're going to come and go and they're going to be tried together. They're co-conspirators. Um, I, I don't know what it would be. 
Um, uh, the guy wears t-shirts in court, so how can you I, how can you think what he's doing? I was sure you were going to say that he was whispering, "Hey, do you have a shirt I can borrow?" I just came in a t-shirt. I thought that's what you're going to say. You know, um, if I could just say something, Joel. I don't know why the defense attorneys are putting up with that. I mean, I would say. Right. Dude, we don't need you here right now. We we got this. Yeah. We they they, right. they. I'm surprised that they're allowing that. I mean, maybe there's some collegiality there. Maybe he's suggesting some things, but I, that's not a that's not a good picture. I, I, that's not something I would want if I was uh, defending uh, Lori in this case. Interesting. That's is he a, a, is he a is he retained lawyer or is he court appointed? Do we know to represent uh, I, Chad? I believe he's court appointed on this case. Also, oh, he's court appointed. <laughs> Yeah, and to Greg's point, I guess that is bad optics. Um, I'd like to go around the table here. There's a couple more things I want to get to before I let you go. But KCL says, do the guests think that the state, and let's start with Greg, we'll go around the horn. Do the guests think that the state has proven, one, first-degree murder of J.J. and Ty Lee per the statute, two, conspiracy to commit murder for Tammy, Ty Lee, and J.J.? What do you say, Greg? I think the conspiracy count is is easier for the state uh, because of everything that's going on. And I think that's why they they came out of the shoot with their opening statement that this is all about uh, power, money and sex. And that these these uh, Chad and Lori and, and to some extent, uh, Lori's uh, deceased brother, you know, really did come to this conspiracy. I, I think the conspiracy is is probably easier for the state. Have they proven first degree murder of Tylee? And and JJ, boy, you know we talked about the hair a little bit here. That's it's pretty compelling, at least as it re, as it relates to to JJ. And if you if if she's if she committed a crime against JJ, what's to say she didn't commit it to Tylee and, and others? So I mean, I know I haven't answered the question, but I, I the state's done a good job with the conspiracy count. Maybe there's a little doubt there on the first degree murder, but the state's not done yet either. And there was some stuff today that came out that's pretty compelling too. We talk, I think we're going to talk about. Greg is also a savvy politician, knows how to answer a question without really answering it. That's what they do best. <laughs> <laughs> I know that from my years reporting. Uh, Nina, uh, what about you? Do you think that the state has proven their case with first degree murder and conspiracy or too early for you to tell or what? It's too early for me because we haven't heard what the, and we go on about the hair, but we, we know that something's coming. Uh, one way or another, whether it's good or bad. So uh, I work on evidence. So let I I would just want to see what they come up with. Ask me by the end of the week, and hopefully I'll be able to say yes. Hopefully, I will ask you again, uh, Tim. What say you? I agree. Conspiracy is the easier charge because all you have to prove is an agreement. Uh, to prove first degree murder, you have to prove the actual events. Um, I think that the tape on JJ is getting there for the murder of certainly JJ. Uh, I'd like to see what more they have on Tylee that puts her at the scene um, of that murder. Um, and I think it is too soon because obviously the state should want to finish strong. So the DNA is pretty strong. So they must have something stronger to end with unless they're just doing it in a chron chronological order. But they're going to tie it together. Uh, conspiracy is a much easier charge. You see it in federal court all the time. My clients never understand, hey, how can I be convicted of conspiracy? They don't have drugs in my hands. They're not, they don't have to prove that. That's possession. All they got to prove is that you agreed to possess with intent to distribute. And they find out later when they're in prison that that's all they needed. So uh, conspiracy is a, is, a, is a really tough tool for the defense to fight against. It's used on every federal trial. Um, state courts don't usually use it that often. They use it in murder cases, though. They use it in murder cases. Mm -hmm. um, lest anyone think we are not a global show, Echo Echo saying hi from Tasmania. I'm not sure I could find Tasmania on the world map, but I'll have to look it up. Um, Very nice in Tasmania. Have you been? I have been. It's just off Australia. Oh, well, there we go. Look at <laughs> Nina Hobson. Worldly <laughs> Nina Hobson. I love it. Uh, by the way, Nina, can you tell us any of the celebrities that you bodyguarded for and are they a pain in the ass? The ones that are a pain in the ass, I won't name for obviously <laughs> legal reasons. Um, but I actually, my favorite person is Bono. And mm. I look after Bono and you two. And uh, 
amazing. Uh, and you know when you've got a real celebrity because you actually tell them something and they listen rather than you say, hey, I'm a, a security expert here. Can you listen? And when they're not a real celebrity, they say no. So, um, wow. yeah, he, he was amazing and, and wonderful. So very give lucky. A, give, us a, give us a 20 second Bono story, something that. <laughs> OK, here's my here's my Bono story. So don't drink while you're on duty. That's obviously what we do. Um, we're on a yacht. I have a hard life. I'm on a yacht with you two, <laughs> and they are drinking my favorite champagne. I am a bit of a, a champagne snob, and uh, he has a bottle of Cristal, and it's like, would you like a glass? I'm like, oh, yes, I so want a glass, but no, I'm working. So when I finished my shift, I went to say goodnight and hand over, and uh, he said, ah, hold on. We've got this to drink. So I was like, well, he's my client. It's Yeah, I, I feel obliged to drink with you, so... Uh, he and I shared a bottle of Cristal. Thank you, Bono. Love him dearly. Wow. Very cool story. Not a lot of people can say that they shared a <laughs> bottle of Cristal with Bono. So we got the real, we got the real best guest. Look at that. Um, so Alice Gilbert, two more quick things here. She was a, a neighbor and a friend of the Daybells, and uh, she took the stand today. Um, she said that... Uh, Tammy was shy, very organized, knew computers very well, um, and then went on to say that when the when Tammy died, uh, and Nina, I'll send this back to you, uh, the children were stunned, uh, meaning the Daybell children. They were all on the couch and chairs, and they could hardly speak. They were stunned. Chad was not stunned. Emma, the child, uh, older child of the Day Daybells, called Alice, this neighbor sobbing, and said her mom had died. Chad took the phone from Emma and told Alice not to tell you tell anyone and to wait. Um, and it goes on basically that uh, that Chad Daybell at that point wanted nothing to do with his children. Um, and then not far after that was uh, courting around with um, with Larry uh, Lori Vallow and rubbing her leg uh, at the at the table. Um, what does that say to his character? Or does it, what does that say to his guilt or the kind of person that he is? Kind of person that he is, um, just not a nice person. But again, going back to you don't always react the same way people think you're going to react. But these are your kids and their mom has just died. And so you would hope as a parent that there would be some empathy somewhere. Um, and the behavior with with her afterwards again it, it's just he comes across to me as a complete manipulator and I think he he did it with the kids and he's he's done it to a degree with her and that's not me saying that she's innocent or not party to this but I have worked on other murders and the dynamic and the control that the male partner has had to get the female to do things and then go hands off I think that that is his character and, um, oh, I nearly said my thoughts on the guilt, but I'll, I'll reserve that for <laughs> the next file. Good, good catch. Uh, Tim, these two are for you. Jody Johnson. Tim, I love right. you, but I hate the court performance thing, although they do make it more interesting to watch. Followed by my man, Coop3000, who I feel like I haven't seen in a while, Coop. Um, how would the dynamic of the trial have changed if they had shown the hair talked about around the world right out of the gate, Tim. Well, first of all, let me clarify performance. I'm not saying you commit anything unethical. I'm not saying you do anything illegal. I'm saying it's how you phrase your questions, how you fight zealously for your client. You believe in your client. You exude that to the jury knows it. I'm not saying you go there and hide, do tricks like that. No, I'm not saying that. But how you cross-examine, when you cross-examine, when you don't cross-examine, how you argue for your client is the performance. How you cross-examine, what questions you ask, what questions you don't ask. Do you attack a witness or are you nice to the witness? It's all about credibility. Uh, the second question was, why not out the gate? You don't want to give the crescendo effect at the beginning of the play. Why would you do that at the beginning? The jury will forget about it. They'll think it's not important. You're building this up, building this up. This is a terrible crime, terrible people. They're missing, missing. And guess what? Her fingerprints on the poor dead baby or her hair follicles on a dead baby. 
Mm. That's when you see the jurors, they start rocking in the chair. If you ever see a juror rock in the chair, you know what that means? Mm. They're done. They're done. They're now relaxed. And I've showed that to multiple defendants. I said, it's over. They go, what do you mean? It's all over. It's done. And wow. um, we once had a juror one time. The judge goes, do you want to come back tomorrow? This was on court TV, NFL football player. And the juror asked the prosecutor, can you be wrap it up in 15 minutes? <laughs> I leaned to my client and said, it's over. He goes, what do you mean? Oh, he's already decided. They're done. 15 minutes later, it was not guilty. Wow. Uh, super fascinating. So we've had uh, Detective Phil Waters. He's a weekly guest on the show. Talks about um, tells in the interview room during interrogations. And uh, it's just fascinating to hear that because he would know if he was about to get a uh, confession or not by the way the interviewee was uh, moving his head around, up or down, etc. cetera. So, uh, and I'm hoping to do a show with him about the art of the interview uh, to see how that goes. Papa Bear saying hello from Moscow, Idaho. Of course, uh, a place near and dear to our heart, the uh, inauspicious home to the quadruple homicides there in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, Beach Mom saying the death certificate is being changed from the medical examiner as asphyxiation and homicide. Uh, one final thing here, Greg, and then we'll wrap her up. Uh, so in play today was this podcast, uh, an audio podcast that had Lori's voice on it. So we heard from Lori and it was basically these people discussing uh, their beliefs uh, about the world. So um, on the podcast, you hear uh, Lori say, I, too, have seen Jesus Christ. Um, but there was a lot of gamesmanship. The state did not want this admitted. I guess the defense wanted it in because it appeared to show some sort of humanity. I know you have a day job and you're busy defending people, but um, did you follow this at all? Did you make anything of it? I was some sort of surprised by it, by one, first, that the judge allowed it in. I don't know how it was relevant. It was a 2018 podcast for 40 minutes with her and a couple of her friends espousing their a belief in, in God telling them what to do and that type of thing. And uh, I think the defense theory was that the state opened the door by putting on a witness who described the podcast or talked about it. And so they said, oh, well, you open the door, let's play it and let's have the jury hear it. But even then, I mean, we've already we've already established that uh, insanity is not a defense. So you can believe in whatever you want to believe. It's not going to be a defense recognized in the state of Idaho. And so I don't know how that fit into the defense theory of the case or how it's helped them with their reasonable doubt. And which, which leads me back to where we started. The, why, so why is it, was the state making such a fuss about not letting in if they were, and there was certainly some discussion about not letting it in. And uh, ultimately the judge uh, let it in. I don't know how it helped the defense. I, I'm not sure why they why they did that. Sometimes when you fight and kick and scream and the jury knows that to get some evidence in, the jury expects it to be something, you know, and if you don't if you don't carry the carry the day, they, they, they kind of wonder why you were doing that. And I don't I, I hope that wasn't one of those moments for the defense. Uh, the man with that beautiful mahogany, by the way, Tim, I wasn't invited yet, but I could never bring my seven year old daughter into your uh office there because she would uh etch her name into your mahogany and that would put me um in harm's way but what's that she's not allowed she in. Can't. <laughs> he is famed tallahassee defense attorney r timothy jansen a partner in the firm that bears his name jansen and davis he is a hell of a criminal defense attorney and also spent five years as a federal prosecutor uh he is the man and he steps up for our show all the time we appreciate it greatly. And Vroom says uh, to you, Tim, what's in it for him to turn on Lori, uh, meaning Chad, on conspiracy? The kids' remains were found uh, in his backyard, and it was his uh, wife violently smothered in his own home. What's Lori got to do with that? I, I want to go back, if I, you don't mind, quickly on the last question you asked, Greg. 100%. Um, the reason it should not have been introduced was it was a self-serving statement. It's not subject to cross-examination. 
It's like a defendant that gives a statement to the police. If it's favorable for the defendant, the prosecution's not going to let it come in. But if it's negative or confession, it's coming in. I don't know why the judge let it in. It's not relevant. It's self-serving. It's not subject to cross-examination. And I think he made a mistake and he probably bent over to the defense because he felt maybe I better give him that for appeal. Um, I don't see what Chad gets any deal. There's no deal going to be given to Chad if that was the question. It's not up anymore. Um, I don't see Chad getting any deal. Um, are they going on a death penalty on Chad or did they take yeah. that off? They are no, going they, to death penalty. Yeah. Yeah. They yes. took it off? It's no, still on the table for Chad. No, it's yeah. on the ta- it's on the table. And, and I don't know why they did that. Because I think they certainly believe Chad was the one that committed the murders. And probably Chad's the one that buried the bodies. I don't think Lori did. And usually the person that actually commits the heinous crime of murder is the one that's going to get the worst punishment. Um, And I don't understand. I mean, I'm not the prosecutor. They made a decision, probably. They did the same thing in the Murdoch trial. They took death off because maybe they were afraid a juror won't convict if death is on the table. But if it's life, they're more than likely go ahead. Um, I know in Florida, in this circuit, that would have been a death penalty case uh, for sure. And now Florida passed a law now where you don't have to have unanimous. Um, it's going to be less than unanimous. What, what's, just, what's, what's, the, what's the breakdown? I Tim? think it's what eight it to happen? four now. Eight to four, I think. Wow. Florida and Texas, they don't mess around. They do not mess around. Uh, Greg Scordis was a Democrat candidate for Utah Attorney General. He, like Tim Jansen, is a criminal defense attorney out of Salt Lake City since 1982, a damn good defense attorney, and also was a prosecutor, and also helps us out when we're in a pinch, so we are super grateful. Uh, Jennifer, congrats on 50000 uh, but I don't know if you know the answer to this, Greg. Uh, Jennifer, uh, are Chad and Lori allowed to communicate with each other during this time Best true crime show on. Thank you so much. Uh, are they allowed to speak on the phone? I would think not. No, I don't think there's any way those two can communicate. They're both incarcerated. I they, I mean, I think the state would probably want them to communicate so they can listen in and see what they would say, because neither one of them have the sense to not say something dumb. But no, those two haven't communicated, at least directly, uh, for a very long time. Um, I'm just looking at Maggie Seymour's comment. Why does Lori keep wearing black? A lot of our guests who are jury consultants said it is a bad look, uh, almost like she's in mourning that she should be wearing light colors and pastels. But uh, I'm no jury consultant and either is anyone or neither uh, are the people on this panel. But uh, Nina Hobson is a former British detective. She worked covert operations a major crime and uh, did close personal protection, as you heard, for people like Bono. Uh, She was a bodyguard for these celebrities and dignitaries. She's been around the world. She's also an ambassador for children's rights, and she is the host of a new true crime podcast called Codename Siren. You better check it out. My final question has nothing to do with this. When you're guarding a guy like Bono, what is rule number one? Like, what do you have to do? Um, and uh, I imagine the stakes are very high. Uh, what's it like to move around with him? Well, it's it's crazy because his fans are crazy. Like, they're very dedicated. So they have uh, radio contact with each other. They cut you off in the vehicle. I mean, they don't care. And the yacht, I told you we we're on a yacht, so we're actually – Um, moored just off Australia and literally we had fans canoeing out to the yacht climbing up the side of the yacht and there was nothing more satisfying than just stamping on fingers and watching them fall (laughs) (laughs) so um, that's that was like that was a gold moment but yeah I mean it really is difficult and and 99% of the time it's not going to go wrong but we have to be prepared for that one percent and um I mean, we get a lot of fun, too. So I'm very, very lucky. And uh, I know you don't want to divulge too much and I don't want to push my boundaries. But what what are his thoughts on the uh, sort of the 
you know, the fanaticism and the fans, does he think, uh, does, does he question it just as a human being? Like, why are these people so interested in me or, or he totally gets it? No, he totally gets it. And he's also really appreciative. He knows that they're why he's where he is. Um, and, and he's just a, an all round kind of great guy. Some people don't like him for political reasons, but you know, he, he says it how it, how it is. And he's just a really good guy. That's my personal opinion, having worked with him. Um, but yeah, he's he's cool. He's a really cool guy. Very good. I love hearing good stories. I worked in the media for 26, 27 years. And same thing. Uh, there are some great people and uh, some people that uh, I'd like to step into the octagon. With. Those, yeah, those, we'll do those, another those, show, Joel, one day and I'll, I'll give you all the, the I'll bad have, people. And I'll, have, I'll have to come on Codename Siren one day. You are you are invited right now, all three of you. <laughs> I love it. We'll uh, we'll reprise our roles there. A uh, quick programming note: We'll be back live tomorrow uh, night on the Lori Valadebel case, and then Friday, twelve thirty p.m. Eastern. It is Great Scott, your true crime Phil, with Detective Phil Waters, who's investigated four hundred homicide cases, as well as former FBI agent Scott Duffy. Sunday night live, seven p.m. Eastern time. It is my mom, Carm. She will be on the case. Hashtag Carm on the case. A huge thank you once again to our best guests and an even bigger thank you to STS Nation for getting us across the 50,000 subscriber line. It is a huge milestone for us. We love you. We appreciate it. And uh, we are just getting cracking. Love you, America. Love you, UK. Love you, Utah. Love you, Tallahassee. Love you, Gators. And love you, Seminoles. Ha, <laughs> ha,